Hey, shalom, guys, and welcome to Wisdom and Torah Ministries. I'm always happy to be here with you. Thank you for joining me in this particular uh, broadcast that my teacher and I, Joseph Good, are doing, and I are doing. Uh, it is important. He'll be with me here in a few minutes, uh, but it is imperative that we do this particular uh, broadcast live in regards to the the topic that is at hand right now. There seems to be uh, fear going around misinformation, and uh, basically fake news in regards to the status of the red heifer. And, you know, I think it's important that we as believers understand that there are protocols in the Bible. Many of us, or many people, are not really researching certain areas that actually lend itself in order to understand some of these topics. And sometimes we turn our ears to people who really don't study it, don't research it, and in in, uh, in a deeper way, uh, I have my teacher Joseph Good. I don't know if Joseph if Joseph is here. If Joe, if you're here, please come back on. And um, you know, and it is important that we go right to the sources of the people who can help us understand. I spent an hour this morning with uh, a a gentleman named Adam uh, Berkowitz. He was at the uh, uh, Temple Institute conference last Wednesday. He is he speaks Hebrew. He was there when the heifers got to Israel. He knows all the players involved, as well as we do. Joe and myself, we know who those people are. And um, and it is important that you, I specifically now, I get calls and I get people sending me messages. And the thing is, they're sending me also videos, or all kinds of videos from different types of people. And I'm not going to sit here and try to criticize anybody else. It's really not of my concern. But I tell you what, it only takes me a few minutes to realize that what those people are saying is not true. And you need to also have that kind of understanding in order to discern who is speaking truth and who is not, specifically at this time. That is important to bring um, uh, balance, to bring um, understanding, and the lack of fear that could be concrete in our faith. And I think this is something that we must remember and that we must understand, okay? I want everyone here to so please keep your mics off on the in the Zoom call and also your uh, your camera. I really would appreciate it. Anyone on Facebook Live, if you'll be so kind to share with others. And I'm waiting on Joe. I don't know where he went. I, I know he went to get his coffee. That's really what happened. So can somebody call Joe and tell him to please? I'm waiting on him. <laughs> Okay, so the last few weeks, as a matter of fact, since the red heifers got to Israel, the whole world has been in a buzz. Um, I found out how anti-Semitic uh, there are certain people, not all of them, certain people within the Hebrew roots and the Messianics and, and Christianity. And at the same time, I found how many people are willing to learn more about these events that are taking place in these last days. And now, with the whole thing of the eclipse all hell's breaking loose. Everyone thinks the end of the world is tomorrow. They were saying that the red heifer was going to be sacrificed last Sabbath, which, by the way, is not a sacrifice, which, by the way, you cannot possibly do it on a Sabbath because you'll be lighting a fire and you're not allowed to light fire on Shabbat. That only goes to the level of, of lack of understanding of these topics. And you, the audience, you need to spend the time either doing two things, researching it for yourself, and finding out what is, what is not, and the proper context. And they're very, uh, we can give you the resources if you want to, or decide to seek out those people who have direct contact with those involved or the people who actually study the topic. We need to stop listening to people who their focus is not on that particular topic. I'm not saying they're not going to have an, an opinion. I'm not saying they're not going to have things to say on the matter. I get it. People have an opinion, and some people can also uh, have knowledge of those topics. I'm not disregarding that. But when it comes to instilling fear, and when it comes to teaching out areas that you don't study, it's like trying to go to a doctor to take care of your heart, but instead, instead of going to the doctor who actually knows about the heart, who operates on heart, you go to a foot doctor. And you pretend that that guy is going to have the means to tell you what's wrong with your heart. It makes no sense. That's illogical. Everywhere you go, you know, you need to talk to people who know the topic. And we apply it in every aspect of our lives. 
except for the Bible. When we talk about the Bible and we confuse prophecy, this is the problem. We want prophecy, but at what cost? At the cost of lies? Telling someone telling us something that is not really the proper context? And then you're running wild with that and propagating the, 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 the false information and then people are scared? I just had a call from a brother in Mexico who's actually scared out of his mind because he's he's listening to all these people and because he lacks this understanding, he's trying to figure it out. Yeah, and this is something that is very important, okay? And again, I'm not, and this is something that, you know, I hate to make disclaimers all the time. It seems like we live in the era of offended people. And it's just important that you understand that one of the areas, one of the areas that I focus in the last 26 years is the temple. Now, I got a long way to go, but I got together with my teacher who's been doing it 44 years. Ah, he was blocked. Oh, okay. Joe, you can come in, please. To the mic, uh, to the to the camera, I apologize. Let me see right here. Let me make you a co-host. He's going to make you co-host. There you go. Okay. You should be on now. I apologize. I think I blocked you by accident. So... <laughs> I'm trying to tell Joe, uh, Joe, I'm trying to welcome Joe. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I want to thank you for, you know, all the time that you spent teaching me and the patience that you've had and the uh, 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 waiting for me to adapt to the information that you've given. And, and the last 15 years have been the best decision I've ever made uh, learning from you uh, to understand. And this is an example of the benefit of having someone who knows the topic. As you know, Joe, when I came to you, I used to have a teaching called The Mystery of the Red Heifer. I no longer teach that the way I taught it before because unknowingly I was teaching certain things that was wrong. One of them was that it required an altar and the red heifer does not require an altar. Another one was that when I was calling it a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice. It's a, actually a slaughtering. And as you kept teaching me that and you provided the resources, I began to realize that although my intention was noble, I wanted to teach the right things, but I was not studying the right resources that would allow me to come to the right uh, conclusion of the matter. Thus, I was making very, very serious mistakes. No wonder some of the Jewish people were upset because when they watch and when they saw it, obviously it will go against. I still hold to the, the, the similitude and the type and shadow and the metaphor of Yeshua as the purification, you know, for us. That's a different story. But I was using and saying certain things out of context, which I needed to correct. Thus, I removed that teaching because I don't think it would be a beneficial to listen to something that I did in 2003, when after 21 years, now I understand more that would add and correct and fix what I taught wrong. And you know that my intention is never to mislead anybody. With that being said, that means that now we have to be accountable and we have to listen to people that are accountable instead of lending our ear to uh, hearing people who are, by listening to two seconds, Joe can tell you if that guy knows the Bible or the requirements of the red heifer. So Joe, thank you for joining me. How are you today? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Let me kind of explain what's behind me. Okay. Um, we had, uh, back in November, first part of November, we had a flood in our house. And so uh, it took a while for insurance to get started, but we um, we are, uh, we are uh, in a, the process of renovation. So they took down all my library. They had to put new carpet in the house, new walls up in the house, and everything. And just today, we started it. Uh, Edgar Ramos is here, and he is the one that built my bookcases, and uh, we have changed the color. And so what you see, this just happened in the last hour, getting these books up, um, which is a start. But uh, Rico, thanks for having me, and shalom to everyone. And I would like to add something to what you previously said. Um, it's not only a matter of, um, of me speaking to you about the things that I, I thought you were saying that were incorrect, okay? It, it's a matter of that you got to know the people that were involved directly with the, with the, the red heifers. You got to know 
for instance, Mo Borelli. Uh, you got to know some of the rabbis, Rabbi um, uh, uh, Menachem Makover, Rabbi uh, Mordecai Persoff. You got to know um, uh, Eliach Berkowitz, who you spoke to, I think, today. And I spoke to him yesterday. He is the one that, that put out the videos. of the, And so it's not... What I said to you is that you've heard you are seeing all the sources and the people that are directly involved with it. And that's where this information is coming from. Well, that's, you know, this is the whole bottom line that uh, right now in the news, like, for example, after Shabbat, I was I was sitting with Kyle in Canada and I saw three videos. Then when I got home, they sent me another one. Then yesterday I watched, I think, two more. In every single video, although they did share some things that are factual, that are true, uh, the most important steps, they were completely wrong. And the normal, the regular person who are not really researching this, uh, these areas, they are not informed. So they will believe what sounds logical. Uh, let us talk a little bit about the news about the red heifer, Joe. Um, I think people need to see, as you know, the, the red heifers were brought in last September, I think. I know the gentleman whose farm came from. I did a conference with him, and uh, I got to meet him personally. That gentleman loves Israel. Um, I think he follows a lot of the stuff we follow. The heifers, the moment they were born, uh, they were being under super, uh, supervision by rabbis, uh, people in that area in Texas. You can correct me, correct me when I'm wrong. Um, they were under you know, su uh, uh, supervision. They've done everything possible to do the right thing to bring them to the land of Israel. Now, for as far as I know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, people are saying, well, the, the, the heifers have to be from the land of Israel. Well, the, the Torah does not specify that. As a matter of fact, Moses was not in the land of Israel when the first heifer was actually slaughtered. Josephus tells us that was a slaughtering of the red heifer during the time of Moses. And, and yes, can I interrupt you? You can interrupt me anytime you want. You're my teacher. All right, the uh, the first red heifer, according to Josephus, and it's very interesting because in the uh, in the Tanakh um, we have the story of the death of Miriam. Okay, so I'm going to turn to it. Uh, okay, Miriam, the, the sister of Moshe, and uh, that is uh, the death of Miriam is in. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, oh, I'm, somehow my pages are stuck together. Give me a second. Bami Bar Numbers chapter 19 is the chapter on the red heifer. Um, chapter and, 20. Chapter 20. Yeah, Miriam dies in chapter 20, verse 1. Chapter 19 is the red heifer. Okay? Now, Josephus tells us that the first red heifer was when Miriam died. Okay? So, uh, you can see in the Tanakh, it's basically uh, uh, it's uh, justifying what Josephus tells us. But that was your first red heifer. And as you mentioned, there was no land of Israel at this time. Right. Also, Joe, there was uh, in chapter 16 and 17, remember that Korah and that uh, many of the tribe of Dan died in the camp. So there was a particular, there was a plague and there was death everywhere within the camp at that time too. Right. Which, which brought, of course, co uh, corpse impurity. Correct. I have a question for you, Rico. Oh, okay. Why didn't they have the red heifer right when they came out. Why didn't they have it right when they got the Mishkan? Okay, so when Miriam dies, that's at the end of the 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. So Miriam's going to die, and then she's going to be followed by Aaron or Aaron, who's followed by Moshe. Yeah. Okay, so why didn't they need the red heifer until that time? Because it, the commandment of the red heifer will deal with in the land of Israel, but the cow does not have to come from the land of Israel. Uh, exactly. So that's very important that, that we need to know is uh, the proper rituals and procedures 
of what the red heifer and the qualifications for the for the heifers. Uh, tell us a little bit about the age. People always talk about the age of the heifer, and there's the the Hebrew word that you taught me, egla, and egla. the differences. Please go ahead and expand a little bit on that. Right. Uh, well, uh, let me read from the Mishnah. This is from the tractate Para. Okay. okay. So before you continue, Joe, I want to make sure that I tell the audience. Right now, we don't have room for every single one of you, and I'm going to be straightforward with this, to criticize any resource that we use. If you want to know the proper context, we need to utilize every resource available because it's unfair to criticize the resources that goes back 1,000, 2,000, whatever years, but then believe anyone who sounds logical on the internet that has no clue about this context. So if we really want to understand this, you need to be open-minded and leave the criticism behind of what you think we know and look at every available information to get this a better clarity on this. I mean, I hope we're clear on this one because every time we say Mishnah, all of a sudden people start arguing, but yet they go listen to somebody on the news or someone on the internet who doesn't use any of the resources in order to validate the information, and then they follow after that person and they live in fear. This is the reason why not once has Joe or myself have gone on the internet instilling fear, telling you that the red heifer is going to be slaughtering tomorrow. You know why? Because we know and we follow the rules and we follow the steps. Once you know, then you understand what the next steps are following. So go ahead, Joe. Quote qu from the Mishnah Para. Okay. And so in the Para, this is chapter one in Mishnah one. All right. And it says, Rabbi Eliezer says, by the way, this is Rabbi Eliezer ben Hirikanis. You, If you go to a Passover uh, Seder and they use the Haggadah, it talks about Rabbi uh, Eliezer ben Hirikanis. And he was believed to have been a believer in Yeshua. It's very right. interesting. Uh, Rabbi Eliezer says, an egla. Okay. An egla means a cat. But in Bob and Bar chapter 19, it uses a different word. It uses para. Now, a par, P-A-R, is going to be a bull. Para is a cow. Okay, so in here, it, it says, Rabbi Eliezer says an egla, and then they have a discussion about how old an egla is. Okay, a cow. Uh, uh, it says... Uh, Rabbi Eliezer says an egla is a one-year-old and a pra a two-year-old. But the sages say, now, Rico, when you see the expression in the mission, but the sages say, what does that tell you? It's a Sanhedrin council, which is the legal court, and they're yeah. making a decree based on the Torah uh, commandment. All right. So the, the, the Sanhedrin said, no, Rabbi Eliezer, you're wrong. And egla is a two-year-old. And a para is a three-year-old or a four-year-old, okay? Now, uh, I want to come over to a later Mishnah. I think it's about uh, Mishnah 5. And uh, ah, in para 1-4, um, it tells us that... Uh, it's talking about the sin offerings of the community and their burn offerings. The sin offering of the individual, the guilt offering of the Nazarite, the guilt offering of the Matsura, one with biblical leprosy, or fit from the 30th day onwards, and even on the 30th day. Now, for all of those, it says you have to have a one-year-old animal, okay? But they're saying that you don't have to wait a year that from the 30th day onwards, and even on the 30th day, if he offered them on the eighth day, they are fit, okay? So let me let me see if I can simplify this in, for, in reference to the cow, because they're really talking about the cow here. In reference to the cow, the cow is one year old on its eighth day, okay? So... For it to be three years old, how old must it be? Mm -hmm. I'm asking, Rico. Oh, okay. You're putting me in the spot. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> two and a half? No. Okay. Two years and eight days. 
Oh, that's right. Two years and eight days. Two years and eight days. Okay. And so a, a child, a, a baby, a human is was considered in the biblical times on the eighth day to be one year old. Correct. Right. And, and by the way, that has an effect of when we read the Gospels. And Herod kills all the babies two and under. Well, he killed them one year and eight days. Then that would be um, uh, that would be a two year old. Got okay. It. Yeah. So we are establishing the age of the heifer, the difference yes. between the paga and the egla. Uh, right. In regards to, let's talk about one one topic at a time. Let's let's look at. Does it does it require an altar? Because on the news and the people promoting all this fake news going around, they keep saying they build the altar and they are showing the altar that is actually made of metal and it's actually to help in reenactment. So is the altar kosher uh, for the slaughtering of the red heifer? I know the answer, but the audience doesn't. Can you help us? Okay, sure. Uh, the the uh... We have the ceremony that is explained to us. Uh, and our primary sources are going to be, of course, Numbers 19, Bhaman Bar 19, and the, the Mishnah Tractate Parah, which was in that period, in that time, and they're describing how it was done. So they're not meant to be one opposed to the other. They're meant to be two joined together. Okay? And so... Let me ask you a question so that maybe this will help. Uh, Rico, how many commandments do we have? 613. 613. And they're found in the Tanakh, right? In the Torah and even in the balance of the Tanakh. Okay? Correct. Yeah. How many do we have explained? Oh, very. Not all, holy. For example, the Sabbath. I remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, but then how do you keep it holy? How do you come from? Uh, so you need a body uh, of uh, people according to Deuteronomy 17 and also the commandment that God gave to the priests to separate the holy and the profane, the clean and unclean. So they are the ones who determine how these rituals took place without without transgressing the Torah. Okay. Sorry, my phone's, my office phone's ringing. Okay, now say that uh, say that again. Um, I couldn't hear the last no part. That based on uh, who are the people authorized, in order to give the explanation, that sometimes the commandment is not explained because yeah. it's written to a people who understood the culture, the language, and they also understood there was a structure, structure of government, and the structure to the holy things being uh, referred to uh, the priests. So therefore, they were the ones. Anything dealing with holy things like their feast, the, uh, the new moon, the sacrifices, the korbanot, the offerings, uh, the red heifer, paraduma, fell under the jurisdiction of the priests that to actually tell us how to perform all of these rituals because, for example, the, uh, the red heifer gives you explanations, but it doesn't tell you how many tons of wood you need for it. Doesn't tell you how many uh, 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 kilos of ash are you gonna have Per heifer. So things like that. Right. Um, okay. So the the what the Mishnah is, is the legal enactments of the Sanhedrin. Now, this is a direct uh draws directly from uh chapter 18 of uh of Shemot, Exodus in the Parshat Yithro, when Yithro or Jethro comes out to meet Moshe. And he, he sits all day judging the people. And uh, uh, Yitro asking, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're going to wear yourself out and the people out. And he says, well, I teach the people the commandments of God and how to walk in them. Okay? Now, that became the mandate of the Sanhedrin. So in the Tractate Parah, it tells us the, the commandment that we have that a red heifer be offered. We're given a few details that it has to be outside the camp uh, in Numbers 19. It has to be a three-year-old. It has to be a cow, okay? Uh, but in the Mishnah, it fills out all these details of how they did, okay? So we have a description 
of how they uh, uh, they uh, went to the Mount of Olives. And if I can read, uh, this is from the Tractate Parah, okay? Chapter 3 in Mishnah 6. It says a ramp was made from the Temple Mount to the Mount of Anointment. That's the Mount of Olives. By arches upon arches with an arch directly above the post below because of a grave in the depths. On it, the coin who was to burn the cow, the cow, and all, all who assisted proceeded to the Mount of Anointment. Now, I'm going to go forward. It tells us some more details we don't need right now. And But we have... Uh, All right, in 3a, they're talking about the, the, the priest that's going to slaughter the red heifer. They laid their hands on him and said to him, My Lord, Kohen Gadol, immerse once. He went down, made one immersion, came up and dried himself. Wood was arranged there, cedar wood and pine and spruce and smooth fig tree wood. They set it up like a tower and open windows in it with its forepart toward the west. Can I say something real quick? Sure. In the in the book of uh, Numbers, chapter nineteen, and if you may allow me to share it, because I want them, uh, I want them to understand where you're coming from, because it doesn't say in the text, in the book of Numbers, that is a uh, that is a sacrifice. I used to say that, and it's not. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, when you go into, let me share the screen real quick. Right here, I want you to notice that. Okay, it says in verse two, uh, verse three, it tells us, and you will give it to Eliezer the priest, and it will be brought outside to a, uh, outside a place, uh, to a place outside the camp, which you already know is the Mount of Olives, because outside the camp will be east of the tabernacle, which was east, obviously, and it will be slaughtered in his presence. It doesn't say korbanot anywhere there. It's talking about slaughtering. It doesn't mention an altar. And yeah, that's very important. What is the Hebrew word for slaughter? It's actually shachat. Okay, in this case it's shachat. Usually it's zavak. And uh, zavak, uh, shachat is going to be, uh, I'm pretty sure, from the, derived from the word zavak. Right. Or box from Shahak, rather. Yeah. You got it right here. Yeah. The box slaughtering, butchering. Sebach, slaughter, communal. Yes. That's one of the definitions that you see here. So, right. That's what it's called, is Zabach, not a korban. What is required for it to be a korban? An altar. Okay. An altar. And what else? Man, I went blank. Okay, I'll help you. Yeah, please. It has to be in the inner courtyard of the temple. Oh, that's right. It has to be in the uh, Azara. Right. We're told, uh, it, now, an altar that's not in the temple is called a Bama. Okay? Uh, that's a high place. Correct. And we're told that when they had the Mishkan, or the, the tabernacle, and they came into the land, the Mishkan was at Gilgal first. When they had the, the Mishkan and Gilgal, they were allowed to have Bamot, high places, okay? Now, Abama, it can be to a pagan god, but there were also Bamot that were to God. Abama means an altar outside the Mishkan or outside the temple, all right? So we have, uh, when the, the, the Mishkan or the tabernacle came to Shiloh, it was there 369 years. They The Bamot were not allowed. Now, you remember, Shiloh got burned. Correct. And, and so it moved to Nov. Okay? And so at Nov, they could have Bamot. High place. An altar. Right. They could have an altar outside the, the area of the Mishkan. That would be for burnt offerings, you, that would be for peace offerings, thank offerings. You still would have to go to the Mishkan 
in order to bring a sin offering, a trespass offering, any of those. Okay, now, when after Noah got destroyed, it moved to Gibeon. Okay, that's where Saul's uh, city was. And they had the Mishkan set up there, and the people could have Bamo. However, when it came to Jerusalem, it says the, the high places, the Bamot, were never allowed again. All right? So a korban, an offering, has to be offered. It has to be slaughtered within the inner courtyard of the temple, and its blood has to be applied to the altar. Okay? And it has the, to, and the blood, the, according to Leviticus, Joe, the blood is only manipulated by the priest. No one right. else. That's right. Which, by the way, the red heifer, the blood is the only. It's the only. It's actually there's two that the the Azazel, the gate, the scapegoat for Azazel, is is a, is a unique as the one, except for one thing, the the one for Azazel is is the two hands of the high priest is the only one of all the korbanots that actually has um uh in, uh. uh Transfer the sins into that animal, the only one for the national, for the national, for the whole nation. Okay, but it goes into the uh, into the wilderness and it dies. Not part of the blood, the uh, the carcass. Nothing is brought into the temple. The uh, the one, the other goat for the Lord. For what I've been researching, and I've asked you about this, only the blood is used, but everything else is burned outside of the camp. That's right. Well, so then the red heifer, the red heifer. Is taken outside the camp to a clean place in this clay, in this place, in this case, the Mount of Olives, but only the blood is sprinkled towards the temple or the tabernacle. None of it comes inside of it. Therefore, right. it's not a sacrifice because it needs an altar, although the um the blood is sprinkled towards the temple, but it doesn't touch anything within the temple. It's quite interesting. There's one more point. Yes. Cohen slaughters the red heifer. Not only must he sprinkle the blood, and the blood is sprinkled in a particular way. He has a basin, and the, the basin is called a Mizrach. Now, he's going to dip his index finger on his right hand into the blood, and he's going to sprinkle one time up and seven times down. Okay? As he's doing this, from his vantage point, he has to be able to look across and see into the temple. I'm going to show a model. Can you hear me, model? Can I show it from the temple app? Yeah, let me show it here, and then you can follow it up from the temple app, okay? Now, he's going to be way back over here on the east. This is the east side, and he has to look over, and we're told that this wall... This is the wall to the court of the women. The eastern wall to the court of the women is going to be lower than the other walls. And so he looks over and he has to look through this gate right here. I don't have a pointer. Wait, I do. Okay. He has to look through this gate and the altar, we're told in the tractate Kelim, they used a shorter cubit for the height of the altar which allowed him to be able to look over, and he had to look right here, okay? Now, right here, this is this is the porch of the altar. This is the doorway of the altar. Uh, excuse me, the porch of the temple, and this is eight stories high. It doesn't look like it in this model, but it is eight stories high, and he has to look right to that point. So it's a line of sight along with the blood being sprinkled in that direction. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I'm showing the app, the temple the temple app that you and I have. And this is looking from the Mount of Olives towards the temple. It is looking from the Mount of Olives towards the temple. So it would have been a little lower where we're at right there, but it would have been looking towards the temple to where you're talking about. So... It is important that the audience understands that there are specific requirements that must take place, and you cannot change the requirements and the procedures 
just because the people presenting it are still very Christian in their uh, in their way they manage this information. Please understand this. And I don't mean this in a demeaning way. And the reason why we're taking the time to quote the verse, to quote the verses, to quote the Mishnah, give you this information. You may be thinking, but all I care about is the prophecy. Well, we're trying to give you the foundation. So when, when things really happen, you know that they're going on the right steps. Because let's say, let me give you an example, Joe. I'm going to ask you this question. Let's say that right now, the Jewish people, and again, they're very zealous about how they do stuff. Let's just say right now, the Jewish people are deciding to slaughter or to sacrifice the red heifer. And the guys in charge put an altar on the head looking east and the, uh, uh, on the feet looking south. Uh, you know the temple protocol. Would that red heifer slaughter be acceptable before God? No. Although no. they put in the heifer the moment they put an altar and they put the head looking in one direction and the feet in the other, then you got a problem. They may be doing the slaughtering, but it's not legitimate. Right. You brought up an interesting point. This is going to sound like um, detail that's unnecessary, but everything is necessary. Uh, the uh, the body or the, the, the cow, when she is brought into this uh, this assortment of wood, uh, it goes on and describes it's like a tower. So they bring her inside of this tower. They're going to slaughter her there. And she will fall basically on the pile of wood, but she's surrounded by wood. Now, her body has to be to the south. Her head has to be turned to the west. So they're on the east side of the temple. So what is she looking towards? The Holy of Holies. She's looking towards the temple building. She's looking towards the throne of God. And so the Cohen that slaughters her, he has to be on the east side of her. And he will have the, a knife in his right hand. He has to have both feet on the ground when he cuts her throat. Now, she, when she falls... He and only he can draw, can collect the blood. And so he will go from there and to this point where he can, has this clear vantage to be able to see the porch of the ulam, okay, the, the, uh, the platform of the ulam, that's the, the porch of the temple. And he, uh, he has to be able to have that eye contact and then he will start sprinkling the blood okay so there's a very exact procedure in how this is done correct so if he's if he slaughters it and a levite uh collects the blood is it legitimate if the uh, no levite. no the because according uh, to the torah only the priest no blood only a coin can exactly again to, to the audience who are watching watching us and listening to us, you may be saying, Rico, get to the point. Tell us the prophetic. Don't you understand that this is part of that? Because if they start slaughtering a red heifer and you don't recognize any single one of these steps. And by the way, another misinformation is, oh, if, it, if they're not using a priest who don't believe in Yeshua, it's not legitimate. That is the biggest I don't understand. When the commandment for the red heifer was given, God says to Eliezer, who was the priest, the high priest at that time, right? Therefore. No, Aaron was the high priest. I'm sorry, Aaron. Give it to the priest. Aaron designated Eliezer to slaughter it in his place. Exactly. So okay. the fact, it's like me saying, I'm going to go see my doctor. But in order for him to treat me, to do his function, to do his office as a doctor, he needs to believe in Yeshua. If not, it's not legitimate. I mean, come on, people. We should know better than that. When the Lord establishes these roles and functions in the temple, it's to do a particular work. Now, obviously, we would like for all of them to believe in Messiah. 
But that's not that doesn't mean that if they don't believe in Yeshua, that they're not actually doing according to what the Torah says. We need to learn separating one thing from the other. Okay, so this is one of the things. So we talked about the altar. We talked about. I'm sorry. We talked that it's not an altar. So if you see anybody promoting on the news, YouTube, that, oh, they build the altar. By the way, I was talking to Berkowitz this morning, and we all know, and you know this, that altar is what? What is the altar, Joe? Tell us about the altar that he that they're showing in the news. It's funny, because you and I know what it's all about. It, it's, a, uh, it's a model, basically, of an altar. And uh, it is the minimum size for an altar, uh, but it's not, uh, in the, when they show these pictures in, in Israel, the, uh, goodness gracious, uh, it, it makes us look ridiculous because uh, anyone that has any knowledge of the Red Heifer, right. they know that this is not, you know, there's a very interesting point, uh, point too, is that not only is it not an altar, but they actually uh, was there was a pit, and uh, stop and think about it. Uh, the the wood is going to burn, right? And the cow is going to burn. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've been in Israel. Is Israel a pretty windy place? Yeah, pretty much. All right. What would happen if you had all these ashes, and then you see this red heifer that you've waited years and years and years to get? You spent yeah. all the money to get this red heifer, and you see it blowing off in the wind. Exactly. Okay. The ashes everywhere. They uh, it was slaughtered. The the wood pile uh, that is shaped like a tower that they take this cow into is generally in a pit, usually something like a wine press. Okay, anything but an altar. And right. so, so uh, so so yeah. far we covered that the news is presenting misinformation and basically fake news. They're inciting fear. They are inciting uh, people to live, uh, to make decisions. And by the way, this is creating a huge anti-Semitic thing going on. Because if you do not understand the offerings, if you do not know the rules of the holy things in the temple, uh, then you will make a lot of mistakes. And by the way, I want you to be aware of this. And I'm going to say this straight to the point. You... We need to learn that there are certain things that are holy you don't mess with. Biblically, that's one of the biggest classes that Joe gave me in the beginning about Kedusha, holiness. And all these things fall under the umbrella of holiness. And when you deal with these things, it's a decree, by the way. The red heifer is a decree. It has nothing to do with Yeshua in the sense that Yeshua came to do a work of purifying us consecrating us and humanity so that death will be defeated through his resurrection. That's a different story. The red heifer's purpose was to purify the people when they had contact with anything connected with death in order for them to enter the temple. The same result, different way, the red heifer for the earthly. And in our faith, we believe Yeshua's resurrection becomes a type of that through his death and resurrection, God has consecrated us and has defeated death in order for us to enter into his sacred space. But that does not mean that if the temple is standing, that there are people who want to go visit and still have a connection with something with death, that they need to be purified. So, Joe, do me a favor. Let's talk about the word chatat or chatat, because many people do not understand that the word sin offering is actually a purification offering. Would you talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, th there's this concept. Uh, one of the things I like to ask people when we do these seminars is, did Yeshua ever offer a sin offering? I guarantee he did. Yeah, okay? of course. If, if he didn't, he cannot possibly be the Messiah. Correct. Okay? Uh, the concept that Christianity puts out is that a person sins, a person must bring a sin offering, okay? It doesn't mean a sin offering that a person has sinned. Uh, the, the classic example is a woman that is married, that 
uh, has a baby is required to bring us an offering for the birth of the baby. And you yes. say, wait a second, she just fulfilled one of the, one of the most important, one of the, the earliest commandments that we have in the entire scripture. She fulfilled it. Why is she having to bring us an offering? Because the nephesh, the life, is in the blood. And so when sin came into the world, death came into the world. And so with the birth of a child, there is loss of blood. And so it deals with a principle rather than an actual sin. And as you mentioned, Rico, it, it is a purification offering that is being brought because of sin in the world. And many times it would include an individual who sinned, but not all the time. Right. And, and something it could be for a, a, prohibited, a prohibited commandment that he didn't fulfill. He will bring a sin because he could. OK, this is the one thing that I need you to understand. OK, and this is important. Joe knows the answer, but I want to post the, uh, the question to all of you on Facebook and the people here in the chat. Give me an answer. What defiles the temple? Israel's sin or demons? Because everyone now is looking for a demon in every corner. If you get the right answer, then you'll understand this whole thing. When someone uh, uh, unwillful or willfully, meaning willful, um, that he does it and then he repents. Not rebellion. I'm talking about willful that because of the flesh and the weakness and he recognizes I did something wrong and he transgressed a prohibitive commandment. We call it a negative commandment. And Joe, please, you know you can correct me anytime. Um, so someone uh, transgressed that kind of command, they need, to be, they need to be reconciled with God and be uh, uh, purification. They need his sin defiled the altar. Leviticus 16 Verse 15 and 16, which is the need for the Yom HaKippurim offering. And there are other verses that talks about the same thing too. So the daily offerings were done for free will, Allah, or you can do a peace, Shalamin, or you can do a sin or a purification, or a sham, trespass. Again, these things were designed to bring you near to God. But let me ask you all a question. Let's say you live perfectly your whole life following the Torah. You did everything according, blameless, like the Bible says about Zachariah, right? Do yes. you still die? Yeah. You, uh, we still die. So the Torah and the work of Yeshua was that through his death, who was a righteous man and a moral man who followed the letter to the Torah, he proved to us that he that a human being can follow the Torah. Yeshua proved to us that he went through everything we go through in order to prove that we can follow the Torah up to the standards that God requires. And because death was something that is due to what happened in the garden with Adam, which is exactly what Romans chapter 3 to 8 is trying to tell us. Okay, and 1 Corinthians 15 is trying to convey to us that message that the resurrection of Yeshua proves that the God of Israel has dominion over death. Therefore, there is a parallel in a comparison between what the red heifer's function is to cleanse you from coarse impurity to enter the temple and the work of Yeshua and his resurrection, that his death and resurrection now allows us to be consecrated back to God in which dead no longer has dominion to enter the garden. That is the parallel. But just because we die, Yeshua died and resurrected does not eliminate the decree that God established on the earth on his temple. Because it's a decree. We need to know the differences. And the book of Hebrews clearly tells you, if only you understand the temple service. Did I pass the test, Joe? You passed the test. All right, good. Again, uh, by the way, I want to say something in honor of my teacher. I Many of these things I didn't really understand in the beginning. That's why I have to remove certain teachings that I did on the book of Hebrews. When I began to really look into this offering systems and look into all the information, I'm thinking, wow, I understand now the purpose of Yeshua's death and resurrection. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 tells you, I mean, there are verses that support this. And when you go to the book of Hebrews, 
then it makes sense what the message is all about, how God is trying to restore humanity from the realm of death to the realm of life. So we talked, Joe, about whether it's an altar or a ramp or a pit. We now know that it is not an altar. So if right. you see someone promoting an altar and they tell you, oh, they build the altar, fake news, turn it off and call it what it is. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. We also understand that only the priests can manipulate the blood and slaughter it. It has to be in a pit. It has to be uh, with a particular, even the, even the wood is supposed to be, uh, because it takes about nine hours for that thing to burn in a few days for the ashes to actually, the ashes you know. To cool enough to work them. I'm sorry? Three days for the ashes to cool enough for them to work them. And by the way, we have now scientific evidence of this because one of the things that I was talking with uh, Berkowitz about this, he wrote an article. He wrote an article. Let me see if I can find it. He wrote an article. It's called The Burning of the Red Heifer in 2019. What are you looking for? I'm going to see if I can grab something. I'll be right back. The Breaking Israel News by the Ladies News Biblical Perspective. Let me let me share with you guys so you can see it. This is not a... What I'm about to show you is actually a scientific research they did. Now, I spoke with the writer of the article. His name is Adam Eliyahu Berkowitz. He wrote this in August 15, 2019. That's actually when it came out. So they did a burning of a heifer. The burning of heifer takes place in preparation for the third temple. Now, what they did, they uh, a particular, uh, um, uh, it was a, like science in the Bible. Let me read it to you, trying to find the person who did it. Okay, let me go back here. So what they did, they actually made a pit. Now, by the way, this was not the red heifer. This was a an examination or doing a burning of a heifer, right, to find out how many kilos of the ashes they would have, how many hours uh, it would take to burn the wood, for the wood to burn, how many days would it take for the uh, ashes to cool in order for them to be able to, uh, to have the ashes, okay? So this article, if you want, I could place it later on my Facebook, and you can have it. And you can find it on the internet. I talked to the writer today. Okay, so the whole idea of this thing, and this is the pit. What you're seeing are pictures of a burning they did with the same age and the same approximate weight of what a particular heifer that was closest to what it was uh, 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 raised in Israel. The farthest type of heifer they can find that will be born in Israel or that they used back in the day according to its weight. And this is the pit of the fire. These are the ashes of this particular thing that they did. Now, again, let me reiterate, because I know people run with stuff. This is not the the uh, the pit for the red heifer. This was a pit that they were trying to do a scientific project in conjunction with the Temple Institute to find out how long it will take to burn. It took nine hours. And then how many days it will take for the ashes to, to cool down. It took about two more days. So in total, three days for this whole process. And then they begin to make it uh, uh, accessible to understand about, you know, what it would take. I'm looking for the name. Oh, here we go. Professor Sahar Amar was the professor who actually came forward and say, let us do a, a, uh, a burning of a heifer and let's see what we come up with to understand the ritual of the red heifer. Joe, uh, you're the one who sent me this article a long time ago. Go ahead and tell me about it. Um, the, this professor is at Boyline University. And their purpose was they needed to find out uh, how to arrange the wood because that would have to deal with the burning of the cow. Number two, they, they have a list of the woods. They had to find out once it burned down, uh, and they collected the ash. How many sprinklings would they be able to get from one, uh, one uh, a cow of that age? And so uh, it was a tremendous experiment. The, the material they learned was invaluable, and it set the uh, the road path 
to where we are at this time with heifers in the land and the real possibility of this uh, mitzvah, this commandment of God to be uh, be performed. Hey, Joe, can I share a little bit of this article? Because it's really significant what they found. And that's something that um, Berkowitz and I were talking about. He was really excited about how many sprinklings can you do. So let me read a little bit, okay? So I want you to get the bigger picture. My whole objective with this video is that the audience will get the most precise, in-depth information about this particular topic. Uh, and then you go back and look it up and compare. Don't believe anything else I, we say. Go back and look it up. So according to um, the professor, it says the purpose, oh, right here, watch this. Uh, one of the models that were used to build the experimental program was the rite of cremation, which is conducted to this day in India and Nepal. There, again, it's burning. That's really what it's trying to do. Professor Omar explained the design of the entire experiment took many months, and the implementation itself was carried out far from the eye of the public and the media. Only after analyzing the results did it become possible to publish it. In the course of the experiment, all of the specification mentioned in the sources were reconstructed. So they follow it exactly according to halakha, to the rulings and the Torah, okay? So no one is reinventing the wheel. Beginning with the excavation of a wine press, a rectangular pit, uh, in which the pyre was built and dry, of dry wood, of pine, oak, and fig trees. And by the way, the way you organize the wood would yeah. allow it to burn longer which now explains, Joe, why the offerings, the fire stayed throughout the whole night. It's kind of interesting, right? Well, uh, Rico. Yes. Uh, in in Vayikrat, in Leviticus chapter 1, uh -huh. tells us that on the altar, the fire was to be arranged according to its order. Okay? And so the fire on the altar in the temple, same thing, is it wasn't just a bunch of wood that was piled up there. But it actually had an order so that the 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 parts of the animals would burn down by the appropriate time. Very, very good. It says, quote, for the purpose of the experiment, a mature sick heifer was selected of the Veladi breed, which was prevalent in ancient Israel. Professor Amar said, emphasizing that the heifer used in the experiment was not red. So obviously it's not a red heifer sacrifice. So if someone says, in 2019, they got the ashes of the red heifer, it's not true, okay? It was an experiment. It said the process of burning lasted some nine hours, and the heifer's ashes together with the wood used to burn it yield several tens of kilograms of ashes. It emerges that the amount of ash needed to prepare the ritual water was a minute, was a minute amount sprinkled over the water, based on the amount of ash obtained, the investigator proposed a theoretical model to calculate how many instances, this is really interesting, how many instances of sprinkling the water this amount could actually yield. So now they're trying to figure out how many sprinklings can one heifer actually provide? It gets really cool. This is a groundbreaking study of historical significance because there have been no investigation into the practical implementation of this loss of the red heifer since the destruction of the temple. By the way, according to some evidence, we know now that the last heifer that was slaughtered, it was the year 60 of common era, okay? 10 years before the destruction of the temple. For as far as I know, it says, the experiment was designed to check the amount of ash produced and whether it would be enough to purify every Israelite living today. Watch. I'm not going to read weight to measures here because it's a little bit like very technical. But it says, it says the wood is, um, sorry, let me go here real quick. It says uh, the average amount of ash produced by, from Jerusalem pine is approximately 5.2% of the weight of the wood, 6.7% of the almond tree, 8.5% of sycamore, 8.4% of uh, cypress, 5.4% of walnut. Walnut. Professor Amar confirmed the Mishnah, which stated that the wood with the best qualities for burning of the red heifer came from the fig trees, which were common in the temple era. The wood is fibrous and ignites easily. Professor Amar explains 
and then burns the other wood in the pyre. The ash produced is quite fine and requires little sifting after burning. Okay, so now let me go to... His research concluded that in order to burn a heifer weighing 100 kilos, 100 kilograms, 220 pounds, one half, listen, when you sent me this article, this blew me away. It gets yeah. understanding the sacrifices Joe in the temple and how many were done throughout the day. The amount of wood they used was incredible. Right? Yes. It, it, I mean, it is. And it's going to take a lot of people to get all that wood up there, everything set up. And that's something that we have to, to figure in. Right. One half ton of wood is required. To incinerate, the incineration is carried out in an open space, and the fire reaches temperatures of 800 to 1,000 degrees Celsius. At the end of the process, very little, a little organic material remains. Even the bones turn to powder, okay? In the end, about two to four kilograms of ash remain from the body of the heifer, about 5.3% of the original body. That's quite interesting. Only like, wow, four kilos and, you know, two pounds per kilo. That's not a lot. That's a what? What? 11? 11 pounds? According to Professor Amar, half-tongue heifer would require 5.2 tons of wood or five kilograms of wood for every kilogram of flesh. Now, I know for a fact, and again, please understand, I am not saying this to brag to tell you that we know more than anybody, but we are trying to show you the procedure that Joe and I go through in order to present some facts to you. So that you, it's up to you to go back and compare out there with every fact necessary. For example, Joe just made one particular uh, um, statement. They need all that wood. Do you think you can do that in one hour? <laughs> it's impossible, right, Joe, to do that in one hour? Well, and, and you know, and, and just think of the the planning for it. You've got to you've got to select your woods. You've got to send out the the workmen to collect that wood. You got to make sure that it's not uh, with too much moisture. You know, it's the right uh, for burning. You have to bring the wood and get it assembled there. Then you have to build your pyre, um, and you're going to have to lay the wood in the correct order, as it said. The thing they light first, it lights the other other woods. And so I, very, very scientific. And uh, th there's one thing that uh, has really impressed me, too, that goes along with this. It's a passage that deals with the temple. And this is definitely related to the temple. Okay, this is a temple commandment, even though it doesn't take place in the temple. But we're told in Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9, where the command to build the temple, it says, and just so shall you do it. That includes all the ceremonies. Then you have to, all this detail, there is a reason and a purpose for it. And it's like we're told all scripture is beneficial. All scripture. There isn't a verse that you can, that, that you are allowed to take out or should take out. It's all there for a reason. It's all the plan of God. And same thing with this is that it is all essential. It is ordained by God, and it has to be done in specifically as God uh, gave it in a blueprint, a tough yes, need. Yes, okay. Let me read a little bit more because I want you to get more information on this topic. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about the word, okay? Um Right here. For the trial burning, Professor Amar used logs with a diameter of approximately 20 centimeters. The manner of which the logs were stacked allowed the flames to entirely encompass the logs while also allowing the air to enter. The open logs were approximately 1.9 meters. Now, so he's talking about this is what the this is what the picture of the fire looked like. Okay, the certified picture of what the fire looked like. And this is the heifer on top. Okay. Okay. Now it says, a cow weighing 270 kilograms was used for the experiment and was ritually slaughtered adjacent to the prepared pyre. The blood required for the ritual was collected in the hand of a priest. 
the cow was lifted into the pyre by 12 men using a jury rig litter. Interesting. You, you I, but in this, they did it incorrect. I agree. Yeah, because it says that you take the cow into the pyre, slaughter it there, and they don't lift it onto it. Gotcha. The experiment was carried according to the strictest details of the ritual and the head of the cow towards the south and its legs facing uh, is backwards. The head facing west to no. the west. The, the head is facing south. Yes, but the head is facing to the south temple. Is facing west towards gotcha. the You're right. When the experiment began, the fire spread quickly and within one hour, the belly of the cow collapsed. At this point, cedarwood, hyssop, scarlet uh, dye wool were added to the pyre as per biblical instructions. After two hours, the fire reached a temperature of 940 degrees. The fire burned for nine hours, several days, but several days passed before the ashes had cooled sufficiently to allow them to be collected. That's very important. So they, they take a while to set up, nine hours to burn completely, approximately, and then a few days to get the ashes. In addition to the heifer, 1.4 tons of wood were used in the experiment. This, uh, uh, this produced a total of 66 kilograms of ash and about 4% of the original matter. Professor Amar estimated that the ashes from the actual animal represented 11 kilograms of the total ash. Now, this really gets cool right here. How many people can be purified with the ashes of the red heifer. Remember, it's about corpse impurity. The next stage of the experiment was to determine how many people could be purified with this quantity of ash. Of uh, Yeah, for the purification ritual, a tiny pinch of ash was sprinkled over barrels of spring water, which by the way, we got the water now from the Shiloh. The water is there. Professor Amor determined that in order to facilitate this process, tools should be used to grind the ash into fine powder. For a barrel containing 250 liters of water with an, with an opening of 60 centimeters, Professor Amar determined that 2, uh, 0 to point, I'm sorry, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 grams of ash will, be, will suffice. This works out to about one gram of ash per thousand liters of water. Ritual purification requires only one drop to be sprinkled on each person or object. For this purpose of the experiment, Professor Amar used bunches of tree branches of common hyssop, dipped into one centimeter of water, then sprinkled the water into a container 10 times. Using this method, he determined that one sprinkling required one-tenth of one millimeter of water. On this basis, Professor Amar determined that 66 kilograms, 145.5 pounds of ash will suffice, will be sufficient for at least 660 billion sprinklings. Wow. He also noted that it is permitted to add wood. Uh, each addition of one ton of wood would permit an addition, an additional 250 billion sprinklings. I don't know, but this is really really good research that they did here to explain how this would have worked. No wonder, Joe, when they would slaughter a red heifer, it would last for so long. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, obviously. And, um, you know, one of the things, too, that a lot of people watching this might think everybody has to be sprinkled with the red heifer, the ashes of the red heifer. And that's not true. Uh, because the... To go to the Temple Mount, you don't need to be sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer. Mm -hmm. To go inside the inner courtyards of the Temple Mount, you do. Not the Temple Mount at large, which is where non-Jews can go. The inner courtyards, only Jews can are allowed. Okay? Uh -huh. um, so anyone going into the inner courtyards has to be free from corpse impurity. Beyond the Soreg. Beyond the Soreg, right. Yeah, so no one can have any connection with anything with death. That's really the whole purpose. So so we covered the news. So whatever they're showing you in the news right now is not true. 
Okay, and that's that's just the evidence. Then the ritual, it has to be followed. We learn a lot of steps. I'm going to publish this video again so you guys can go over some of the stuff. Um, the sources in Israel that we have, we literally, Joe and I, we are in direct contact with the people who actually take care of this. I mean, you know, right, Joe? Uh, Rob Macover, Persov, Rab Rabbi Persov, uh, Berkowitz, who... Um, Adam Berkowitz, who was involved in informing about this particular thing. And you know more people who are, Mo, by the way, who was, in, who was involved with this. We yeah. actually know the people. They ask us to be part of the information gathering for you guys to get the benefit of the direct information. The Rabbi Markover, uh, who's one of the two most important sages in Israel on the temple, uh, I've known him well over 30 years. Um, we have meetings um, numbers of times, and um, uh, he was in charge of this conference that just took place. Um, so uh, it's, it's very good to be in a position that you actually can ask the people involved. Correct. There's so much out there that on the internet that has no bearing with the truth. I agree. You know, you know what really saddens me is that there's such a huge anti-tabernacle, anti-temple, anti-everything right now. And what I'm finding out that is coming from people who are not informed. Let me give you one example of what we do, what Joe and I do. Joe has been doing it longer. I'm going to show you a picture. Of um, of a model of the tabernacle, just to give you an info, uh, an idea, okay. Now, we've been researching uh, the temple, and Joe knows that. Wait a minute, I'm trying to find something here. I apologize. And you, he's he's taught me how to validate information, not to come up with my own conclusions. This particular model of the tabernacle is basically us trying to figure out. The same blueprint that was in the tabernacle you see in the temple. Now, when you eat, when you do our korbanot, the offerings, some of them have to be eaten by the priests and the people and their family and some of the people. So can you just eat it anywhere except for the Passover? You eat it in the, within the city of Jerusalem. But there, uh, uh, lina, the, 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 uh, the command of lina, which is you have to eat some of those offerings. Tell us a little bit about that before I show the slide. Okay. Uh, well, first off, when you have an offering, uh, there is a requirement to eat the offering. And uh, everything but a burnt offering. No one eats the burnt offering. Okay, but in, in the case of uh, uh, a, a sin offering called hatat, uh, or a trespass offering, which is called a shab, only the priest are allowed to eat that. And they have to eat it by such and such a time, and they have to eat it within the what we call the Azara, the inner courtyard of the temple. Now there's a problem because you're not allowed to eat in the inner courtyard. So uh, the it's very complicated, but it's also very simple buildings, and you'll find this in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, buildings adjoining to the Azara or the inner courtyard, they have the Kedusha or the sanctification. And we're told that's where they eat. That's straight from the scripture. Right. Well, a peace offering, a thank offering, a Toda offering, a tithe offering, a firstborn offering, these can be, uh, these are in a category of offerings that the people eat. Okay, so you you get to bring your offering and you eat it, but you have to eat it within the camp. Okay, so the camp has to have definition. And so the camp is going to be within the walls of Jerusalem and the temple. You have to eat it in that location. You cannot be as much as a half a finger breadth outside the walls of Jerusalem and eat it with the uh, if you do, you've sinned. You have to eat it by a time frame. There's a time limit. And so uh, all of these, we partake with 
Hashem in the doing. That's right. Uh, but there's specific rules. And uh, uh, it's interesting. As you go into it, it's really good stuff. So, uh, based on that information and the rules of the holy offerings that the priest needed to eat, they couldn't just go just anywhere. So, I went to uh, Ra uh, Joe and I showed him. And then I went to Rabbi Macover, who was basically, he, he is he, he's not the leading one right now. Rabbi, uh, uh, what's his name? Ariel? Ariel? Yeah, Ariel. he's the leading authority sage of the temple in the world right now. So, yeah, Rabbi uh, Mark, right behind him. So Rabbi Makover has come right back. So I met with him, thanks to you, Joe, for setting me up and introducing me. And I presented this slide. Hopefully you can see it. It's on the tabernacle. And I began to explain to him why we were doing that with the tabernacle based on the information of the temple. He looked at it and he just went, yeah, makes perfect sense, according to the temple. And that's why I promote it. Not because I'm saying, oh, he's the only one who has the authority to tell me it's okay. But because I've been taught by my teacher to validate all the information, put it together, and then I had the test to go over, and this is something that Joe told me a long time ago, I want to teach you how to present this information to the sages or to the Jewish people in a manner that they will consider it. And that was my test. He's trying to present it to him in a way that he will look at every source that I quoted. And when I present it to him, he says, yeah. You know, and I think that's something we need to learn by saying things that are not true, by publishing things from people who do not study the subject matter, who are not uh, who are not educated into what we talked about today. And you know that the the temple service is not something that is very well well uh, um, um, it's not very well received within the Hebrew roots and messianics. We all know that. So when you watch a video of a Christian person. Or somebody who's not a um, well informed, or make this their focus of study, they will make certain mistakes in their uh, give on the information given that they're doing. Now, I'm not saying that of the five six videos that I saw, every video had at least fifty to seventy percent correction. They were right, but that thirty percent is the one that does all the damage, and the one that separates from what is true and false. So just because it sounds logical doesn't mean that it's actually good. And that's why we're taking longer to talk to you and give you all of these examples. And I try, and I didn't do it myself. I brought my teacher who's been doing this now how many years? 44? Thereabouts, yeah. 44 years focusing on the temple day in and day and night. So you will think that maybe the kingdom of God over here in the Western world would consider going to the source that actually has a pretty good handle on this topic, who has all the contacts with the people making the decisions. And I'm going to be back in Israel in May, and Joe is going in early May. We are going, we're going to meet with all these people. We're going to talk to them. And we're going to go see, I'm going to go see the Red Heifers got Willie and Shiloh. And I know Joe will too. And we will give you more information to keep you uh, at bay with the proper information to the best of our ability. And I know, and I know, Joe, if we say something that is wrong and we know is wrong, trust me, he's not going to let me go too far without rectifying it. He'll be calling me out. No, that's wrong. You need to fix it. And that's what we need today. Stop living in fear. Stop lending your ear to just anyone that sounds logical and ask the proper questions so that we're not easily deceived. And at the same token, and this is something that Berkowitz told me this morning, when the people who are saying these things begin to talk, they are actually embarrassing themselves. And we lose a lot of credibility within the people in Israel. And you need to recognize that these are holy things. If they see us presenting the right context, the proper way, and they know that we're respecting the biblical sources and the way that is done, we may have an inroad in conversation for them to say, wow, we didn't realize you knew this. Can you tell us more? And we have to be very careful to do things the right way. So go ahead, Joe. You, anything you want to say before we, we finish here? Well, uh, uh, probably everyone knows this, but right now there are two red heifers uh, that are qualified out of the, the original five. Okay. The, uh, 
they become of age right before Pesach, is what I have been told uh, by people that are in the know. And um, I don't know the exact date. I don't know when they'll slaughter them, um, but I know that they have them. And um, the uh, the red heifers, uh, I believe that it's been brought uh, for our time, for our age, and everything that is happening is in the hands of God. And in order to build a temple, they're going to need to have these red heifers. And um, so, you know, it's an exciting time that we live in. And um, uh, I think that there will be more and more the interest. Uh, and I was told this uh, uh, yesterday, and I think that Rico was told it also um, by Eliyahu Berkowitz, uh, that they are totally surprised by the worldwide interest. Uh, the second thing... Uh, okay, can I stop you real quickly? Because I think I missed something. Did you say that they're trying to do... A, that was the original plan, trying to do it before Pesach. Yes. But I don't think that's still there now. We don't know. We don't we know. Don't, I mean, there's a security factor. Um, and... and they probably would not want everybody to know when they were going to do this because there would be those that would try to stop them, whether Muslim or yeah. uh, Christian or whatever. Uh, but uh, the, the fact is they have them. Uh, I would like to mention uh, that, you know, when it's the right time, God's going to give the heifers. It's going to be under the control of God, not man. And um, it's just exciting that we're right on the edge of that, and we might see this great event, this thing that people have waited for thousands of years to occur. Uh, it might happen in our day. It might happen in this year. And one last thing, um, I want to read a passage. I've got to turn to it, though, so give me a second. Um it's in the book of Jeremiah, and um, you might remember, um, let me read a, well, let me read a passage uh, out of the Tractate Parah, and um, give me a second to turn to it, it's in Parah 1-1. And it says, uh, uh, they're talking about the age of the heifer. And it says, Rabbi Yehoshua said, I have not heard of any except a shleshit. Shleshit, shleshit means three-year-old. Okay? And you'll find uh, in Jeremiah chapter 47 or 48, um, there are several references in the prophecies. Uh, um, uh, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse, uh, excuse me, 46, verse 20, um, it says, Egypt is like a very pretty heifer. All right? That's the way it is in a New King James Bible. What it says in a... Uh, a prophecy in uh, this is a Korin Tanakh. Okay, so this is Hebrew. It says a shleshit. Now, if you read it, and someone will say like a three-year-old cow. Understand that in the scripture, there are numbers of places that talk about the red heifer. It tells you it's in the last days. So it's dealing with prophecy. It's in the Akarit Yamin, in the latter days. And it deals with war going on between Israel and other countries surrounding her. And so, you know, people are interested in prophecy. Just let it be good prophecy. Let it be something that is real, that you're able to check out, and that you're not running off with what you heard on the Internet. Okay? Right. You have to be careful. You have to check it out, verify it, and then 
Only with caution do you go for it. I would agree with you. And that's something that I'm hoping that people will consider just continue their education and continue to learn and validate information. To finish it up, uh, Joe, I want to ask you, I'm teaching this. I want to make sure, and I, and I presented this to you at one of the conferences, but I want to make sure that I'm still lining up the right, the right way. If there's things to, to be fixed, I don't mind fixing it. But when I presented this, I called it the prophetic requirements for the second coming of Messiah. And the red heifers, three to five years, we know it's between two and three. I was just going by the source. We had the five candidates at the time. Now we only have two. I got to fix this and edit it. So then you have the ashes are for corpse impurity. Then can you do the red heifer uh, slaughtering without the physical temple? I yes. Mean, I know the answer, but I want to ask you just so that for the benefit of the audience. Yes. And in fact, to build the temple, you need the ashes of the red heifer. Perfect. So, but you need the altar first, and then they will continue to, re to build the rest. Then you have uh, clean from corpse impurity. You got to measure the altar. The dedication of the altar takes eight days, as you know. They start the morning and afternoon offering, the tamid, and the afternoon, the mincha. Then you have to have in place priesthood, Sanhedrin, the offerings in order for that to occur. And then the importance of the Mount of Olives, meaning that the, there are steps that must occur. So when you see the red heifers, you have a requirement. If they slaughter it, it's not just burning it. They got to go to a very strict procedure that would actually make it legal, binding, and the proper way. And if they do everything the proper way, according to the Torah, then you start following the next steps. The reason why this is important is that if you follow the next steps, we know that the false Messiah, hey, I did it, Joe, the false Messiah, Yes. Okay. <laughs> that he will come to defile the altar, correct? Yes. Okay. The Tamid. If you don't know how that happens, if you do not study the temple, if you do not know the requirements and the uh, of the ritual for the Pagaduma, the red heifer, then how will you be able to understand prophecy for the second coming of Messiah? How would you know how the altar is defiled? How would you know that the way they preser presented the uh, or the procedure of the red heifer was done properly? Because if they don't do it the right way, everything else doesn't matter. It's invalid. You need to learn this. And you have a great teacher here who can teach you that. His name is Joseph Good. So please uh, subscribe to his website and maybe consider my website and allow us to guide you. Okay? Again, we're not saying yeah. we're the only authority or that we're the only ones that know. But we have an idea because we research it and we have access to the resources in Israel who are up to date with every decision to be made on this matter. Joe? Uh, I do a teaching every Tuesday night on yes. Facebook. Uh, it's at 7 o'clock Central Time. So if you're Eastern Time, that's your, um, your 6 o'clock. Is that right? No, your 8 o'clock. If you're... Uh, you know, you can adjust the time, but it's on the Hatikva Ministries Facebook page. And uh, Hatikva is spelled H-A-T-I-K-V-A, no H on the end. But tomorrow night, I'm going to teach on the Parade de Ma. I'm oh, going great. To teach for two hours. That it, is great. Yeah. That is awesome. Please help us uh, promote this video. We're going to put it on Facebook and also on YouTube. It's up to you to help us hopefully make it viral so people can be educated a little bit more. Again, I reiterate, if we are wrong in something, we will finish it. I will fix it. We're not pretending to be perfect in everything we say, but we actually, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, and I don't mean it in an arrogant way, we are on the right track of understanding this procedure. We study it. We research it for years. I've been doing the research since 2002, and Joe has been doing it longer because he was there when they brought the one in 1997. Remember? Yes. You were part of that too. So he's been involved in the Red Heifer projects for a long time. Go to the sources that can help you. Stop running to and fro, being scared out of your mind, listening to certain resources that neither do they study it, they do the research, or have any access to the proper context of the information. Allow us 
and give us an opportunity to help you. Okay? May the Lord bless you and keep you. And Joe, always thank you. And I'm grateful and honored to be your student and be your friend. Thank you, Rico. And I am equally honored to have you with me. Yes, sir. All right, guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. And please join Joe tomorrow on his teaching on his on Hatikva. And uh, you learn a lot. He's been teaching a lot about Jewish eschatology. It'll blow you away. You'll learn a lot. Shalom to everyone. Bye-bye.